A desperate 911 call leads to a disturbing discovery. Is she breathing? She's not breathing. It was an apparent gunshot wound. It's a police officer's wife. It seemed to be a suicide. I knew this was foul play. Did Tara Chavez take her own life, or was she the victim of homicide? There's no way Tara could have done it. I'd love to keep my life to herself, but she probably did. The investigation exposes some startling details. He had all these multiple mistresses. I do think Levi's cruelty drove her to commit suicide. It just didn't add up. I want to find out the truth. What is the truth? The 911 call came in at 9.02 p.m. on Sunday, October 21st, 2007. Tell him, tell him, oh God, please, tell him the name, please. Okay, okay. Can you touch her? Tell me if she feels cold. I can't look at it, please, God. And I was actually the on-call violent crimes detective for the Valencia County Sheriff's Office and was notified that there had been a uh, unattended death and that it was an apparent gunshot wound and that it was a police officer's wife. Within minutes, homicide detective Aaron Jones drove to the scene, a residence in Las Lunas, New Mexico, about 20 miles southwest of Albuquerque. The home belonged to Levi Chavez, an Albuquerque police officer, and his wife, Tara. Once I got to the house, I wanted to get an idea of what the scene looked like, and that way I would know what kind of questions to ask Levi. Detective Jones made his way to the couple's bedroom. The victim was kind of propped up in the bed and she was kind of leaning over to her right side. We didn't see any indication of there was blood spatter on the walls or anywhere else. There was a lot of blood coming from her mouth that had flowed down her body and onto the bed and down uh, on the gun. On the nightstand near the bed was an open notebook. To the left of Tara's head, there was a note that read, I'm sorry, Levi. It was certainly a possibility that I could be a suicide note. A tragic ending to a life that began with so much promise. We were always together as a family. We were a tight unit, very tight unit. Tara grew up with her twin brother, Josh, and younger brother, Aaron, but she was daddy's girl. I was extremely close to Tara. I protected all three children, but she was just so easy to get along with for me. Tara was a lot of fun. She loved to draw. She was very artistic. And that was just how she expressed herself a lot of times. According to her parents, Tara was also quiet and a little shy until she laid eyes on Levi Chavez in high school. She just madly fell in love with him from the day she met him. She told me the story about meeting him on the bus and thinking that he was just the most handsome guy on earth. He just swept her off her feet. And I think Levi just fell for her as much as she fell for him. When she was just 16, Tara became pregnant with a baby girl, Andrea. Tara in pregnancy almost seemed natural. She owned it. They were both happy about it. We supported Tara, we supported Andrea. It was important for her to finish school. So we helped her as much as we could. As graduation approached, Tara and Levi planned their wedding. When you're young and you have a child together, uh, the next step is to get married. She wanted to be with him. They wanted to start a life together. About a year after the couple got married, Tara gave birth to their second child, a son, Levi Jr. Tara took care of the children, and Levi worked as an Albuquerque police officer. Tara was a really good mom. Levi was gone a lot, and so she took care of making sure that they had a comfy home to come to. When her youngest child got a little older, Tara decided to pursue a career as a hairstylist. Tara, growing up, became very interested in doing hair. That was her thing. She was super excited to do something on her own. Tara never got the chance to achieve her goals. 
Now, investigators had to figure out how Tara died. The scene itself was a cluster. Uh, the night Tara died, word had gotten back to APD uh, that uh, the wife of one of their officers had been killed. Officers from the Albuquerque Police Department showed up on scene to support Levi. They were obviously concerned, but we had a job to do. We were there to investigate an unattended death, and we didn't know what happened. Jones hoped Levi could shed some light about what led to Tara's death. Levi was sitting in a chair at the kitchen table. He was distraught. Oh, I'm to go ahead and do the rest of my life. Oh, I'll live in blood. I basically tried to console him as well as to do my job as an investigator. The detective quickly discovered that Levi and Tara's relationship was troubled. We've had some problems getting with our marriage to last, last year a day. Maybe it's been fighting constantly. Levi stated that he and his wife had been separated for a while. She loved Levi very much, but it wasn't working. Levi's infidelity was common knowledge amongst her friends. There were times she would tell me that she kicked him out, and then the next thing I knew, he's back. They'd basically been kind of uh, playing roommates uh, for on behalf of his children, who were 6 and 10 at the time. That weekend, the kids stayed with their paternal grandfather. Detective Jones questioned Levi about his whereabouts. Saturday, I worked my shift. Went to a friend's house, stayed there the whole weekend. Levi indicated that he had been staying with another woman, with a fellow officer in Albuquerque during the weekend, and that he eventually decided to come home. This one didn't feel right, you know? I called the house, called at work, no answer. And I was like, you know what, we'll go by. Levi walked into the room, and it basically looked like she was just lying there watching TV until he came closer and realized that she was deceased. I don't see anything. She wake up this nightmare right now. I asked Levi if he really thought that she had killed herself, and he indicated that he thought that she could, that she absolutely, she had been talking about committing suicide. Levi showed Detective Jones a disturbing text he said Tara sent earlier that weekend. She sent me a bunch and I raced them all. Did she start the one? Yeah, one. It says, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt myself. Levi stated that he had been getting phone calls from Tara all weekend, was pretty annoyed by all the phone calls, and so that he had erased them all. Yeah, she called like 80 times, dude. I thought she just wanted to fight. I didn't know she was really like sad, you know? I know that he hurt her a lot. She tried hard, but there was so much damage. Did Tara's sadness drive her to take her own life? There was no way that I could rule out that this was not a suicide. As Detective Jones looked through the house, something bothered him, the gun. It was a Glock, a semi-automatic 9 millimeter. The Glock turned out to be Levi's service weapon. And why in the world would you leave your duty weapon at home? It's really not allowed to allow other people to use, you know, your duty weapon. According to Levi, he left the gun for Tara's protection. We just had the truck stolen. I was scared because I'm over here. I told her, all you have to do is draw it out. Start blasting. After his interview with Levi, Detective Jones was tasked with delivering the heartbreaking news about Tara's death to her parents. We received a very loud knock at the door about 3 o'clock in the morning. I basically had to tell them that their daughter had died from what appeared to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound. I thought he was going to say she was in a car accident, but not suicide. No, no. I looked at Aaron Jones, and I said, you have to lock down the house, start investigating this as a homicide. And he says, why would you tell me this? And I said, because my daughter and I have an appointment set up next Tuesday to start her own business. Who commits suicide with that? She has two loving children. She would never leave her children. Think about what I'm telling you here. Lock down that house. As soon as I left the house from talking to the Cordobas, I, I literally beelined it from my car, grabbed my cell phone, and I called my sergeant on the scene, and I said, they're saying that there's no way she would have killed herself. He said, it's too late. We've already released the scene. The hair stood up on the back of my neck, and I went, oh my god, what have we done? Coming up, questions are raised about Tara's death. Maybe it wasn't as clear-cut as we had thought at the time. 
Looked like a suicide to me. As new information changes the investigation. We knew that the weapon had been tampered with. And the case leads to a surprising conclusion. There were audible gasps throughout the courtroom. The parents of Tara Chavez were devastated when they learned their only daughter was found dead from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Joseph and Teresa Cordova insisted Tara did not kill herself. I knew this was foul play. There's no way that Tara would have committed suicide. If Tara didn't die by suicide, what could have happened and who was to blame? Lead investigator Aaron Jones made a pledge to Tara's parents. I had promised right from the notification that night, I will do whatever it takes. If this is a homicide, then if I'll go to hell and back with you. The autopsy took place the day after Tara's body was found. Authorities and family members hoped the results would reveal the truth about exactly how Tara died. She was found in her home. She was alone. She was in bed. There was a gun next to her, also an ejected casing next to her. We were able to tell that the gunshot went through the back of her mouth, severed the brainstem, and so she died instantly. It seemed to be a suicide. Despite the medical investigator's finding, Detective Jones wasn't ready to wrap the investigation. Suicides happen. What's not common about it is women shooting themselves in the head. They don't want to have a closed casket funeral. It was up to me to confirm or deny that it was a suicide. I was really pushing him to do this. I couldn't see Tara's children growing up thinking, Mama left us. We weren't good enough for Mama. I wasn't going to let that happen. Detective Jones started to take a closer look at the evidence, beginning with a journal belonging to Tara. The journal was actually discovered underneath the bed, I believe, while I was giving the notification to the parents. At first, the journal seemed to support the suicide theory. As we're reading Tara's journal, we're basically finding the life of a very sad woman. She even put in there the fact that she, she wanted to disappear. It was so dark. There was more of an indication that maybe it was actually a suicide. How many times can a person be hurt over and over and over again? One entry dated four months before Tara died read, I can't live like this anymore. Was Tara signaling that she didn't want to go on? As you go through the journal, there's a progression. Something has changed in her life and that she's going to come forward and it's a new day. Turn to the last page, because that page was about her moving on, becoming independent. Tara had developed a newfound confidence. Tara was ready to be done with her marriage. She was making plans. Jones continued his investigation. I began reviewing the crime scene photos, and there were several things that began sticking out to me. Some of those included the blood swipe that was underneath the comforter. According to the detective, the location of the blood swipe was outside the reach of Tara's hand. It was off to the side of underneath the covers that was on Tara's right side. Then there was the gun. We began to look at photographs of the Glock itself. There were voids specifically on the gun on the left side that would have been indicative of a hand and a finger uh, covering that point, but there was no indication of a uh, high velocity blood spatter on Tara's hands. Also, the blood pattern on the gun suggested the shooter was left-handed. Tara was right-handed. The night Tara died, Detective Jones inspected the weapon at the scene. Jones remembered the gun was loaded and ready to be fired, but something appeared odd. When I went to release the magazine from the well, it wasn't seated. I didn't have to push the button to release it. There was a, another round had loaded into the barrel, and it was ready to fire. If the magazine wasn't fully seated, it should not have fed another round into it. It should not have happened that way. So therefore, we knew that the weapon had been tampered with after death, because there's no way Tara could have done it, because she died instantly. Jones speculated someone else accidentally released or dropped the magazine after it was fired. What our theory was, 
the shooter actually had the Glock in their left hand. The gun was stuck in her mouth. The gun was fired. The blood flow occurred, and then the gun was dropped or set into her lap. The hand was actually pulled underneath the covers, and that's where the blood swipe occurred on the sheets underneath it. So as the days went on, we weren't pointing the finger yet at anybody, but we were beginning to believe that this case was, in fact, a homicide, not a suicide. Detective Jones asked the medical investigator to reopen the case. Detective Jones came to the office. He had information that he wanted to express to us that he was concerned about. One of those had to do with the gun and whether she could have done some of these things herself. Maybe it wasn't as clear cut as we had thought at the time. In a rare move, the medical investigator amended her ruling. At that point, we decided that undetermined was a better indication of what we could say about her manner of death than calling it a straight suicide. I was totally elated. So now we're getting somewhere, Aaron. Now there's people who are starting to listen. If Tara didn't die by suicide, who pulled the trigger? Detective Jones began to focus on Tara's husband, Levi. The investigator already knew Levi was seeing another woman before Tara died. But Jones was astounded to discover there were actually many other women in Levi's life. We found out that he had all these multiple mistresses. Levi was having numerous affairs with uh, women from the Albuquerque Police Department not only with co-workers, but with different people from uh, within the community. The information about Levi's affairs did not come as a surprise to Tara's friends and family. Throughout Levi and Tara's relationship, he's always had uh, girlfriends. It hurt Tara. She saw the goodness in him. Otherwise, she would never have stayed with him. But he just kept on and on and on, and it was hard for her. She gave up a lot, she sacrificed a lot. So for him to do that was an ultimate betrayal. It wasn't my job to be the morality police. It was my job to look into this. The night Tara died, Levi claimed he was with one of his girlfriends, Albuquerque police officer Deborah Romero. Detective Jones spoke to Officer Romero, who confirmed Levi's alibi. Now, two weeks after Tara's death, Jones interviewed Levi again, hoping to dial up the pressure. Do you think it's possible that anything else happened besides suicide? I don't know if people want to think of but she probably did. She was making threats all the whole weekend. When I first initially looked at it, my first inclination was, was suicide. So I'll be honest, this, the, the, the scene looks staged. Who do you think would have had any motive to kill her? Nobody. Coming up, the investigation takes a strange turn. She basically said, you probably know that my husband is having an affair with Tara. The investigation into the death of Tara Chavez was growing more complicated. Lead detective Aaron Jones discovered that Tara's husband, Levi, a police officer, had multiple affairs. Then Jones received stunning information from another officer's wife, a woman named Samantha Wheeler. During the course of our conversation, she basically said, you probably know that my husband is having, was having an affair with Tara. But I actually found out that it was Nick Wheeler. So I worked with Nick out in the field. Was Tara's affair somehow tied to her death? Anything could be possible. I began having to dig into just an absolute nightmare. Not only was Nick Wheeler on the police force with Levi Chavez, but there was another deeper connection. Samantha and Tara were actually very good friends. They had all gone to high school together. Detective Jones had to determine if this new revelation was significant. I don't know if I could so much see either one of them potentially killing Tara. Who knows? I needed to talk to both. Jones arranged to speak with the Wheelers at their home. They wouldn't conduct the interview without both of them, Nick and Samantha, being there. Nick admitted um, that he had been having a relationship with Tara. She is. But he didn't want to be with her. He kept hanging out with her. He really felt bad for her. She would talk about suicide. I knew actually what had happened, but I was waiting for him to tell me. And it took him two months. You knew? 
she told me. She's my best friend. She said she didn't want me to kill her. She wanted to never do it. Because I understand where she was coming from. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you kill her? Yeah. I really loved her. Really, I did. Detective Jones wanted to know, where was Nick the weekend Tara died? Well, I'll tell you, the main thing I need to make sure I find Nick's level of proof that he didn't kill him. He was with me? Ultimately, there was no evidence linking Nick or Samantha Wheeler to Tara's death. The focus of the investigation shifted back to Levi, who was living with his children in the house in Las Lunas. Just a few months after Tara died, there was a new surprise. Levi became engaged to another Albuquerque police officer. Tara's parents were upset and frustrated. This is our daughter. We want to know what happened and who is responsible. At this point, I started running my own investigation. I want to find out the truth. What is the truth? Tara's parents never believed their daughter died by suicide. They began doing research to prove their point. I started Googling, how do women commit suicide? The statistics at that time were showing me that they would take pills cut the wrist, and here they're telling me, my daughter, she's gonna put this gun in her mouth and pull the trigger. No, no way in hell. Tara's family also kept going back to a statement they claimed Tara made before her death. We were in Tara's car. Out of the blue, Tara says, well, if anything ever happens to me, Levi did it. I looked at Tara and I asked her, what what are you talking about? What's going on? She goes, oh, no, nothing, Mom. Never mind, never mind. Let's just leave it alone. Tara's alleged statement was shocking, but it didn't prove anything. It was basically up to me to start digging up things. The detective recalled something that could have implications in the case. I learned about the stolen truck during the course of my interview with Levi. He indicated that the truck had been stolen right out of their driveway and that he was uh, concerned, and that's the reason why he had armed Tara with his Glock. Jones found out that Tara suspected the truck wasn't really stolen. According to legal documents, Tara believed Levi was mixed up in an insurance scam. Reportedly, Tara called authorities about the fraud allegation. That really started opening new questions and Aaron Jones to start digging deeper there was a problem. The detective wasn't able to prove that Tara actually made the call. Still, was it a potential motive for murder? At this point, I was absolutely thinking that it could certainly be a motive, uh, because here's the thing, if somebody's gonna dime off a police officer for committing a felony, that's not only a career ender, but it could end up with him in prison as well. Levi denied any wrongdoing and maintained he had absolutely nothing to do with the disappearance of his truck. Levi was placed on paid administrative leave. Nearly nine months after Tara died, the investigation came to a standstill. I thought, we're never gonna get to the bottom of this. Detective Jones suggested a new strategy. He recommended the Cordovas file a civil lawsuit. I was getting stonewalled by some of the Albuquerque police officers. So at that time, I figured we can probably force people to talk under the civil system. We could get answers and depositions and questions, and people would have to speak. They may stonewall us or kiss us off on a criminal investigation, but you get some old federal civil judge and you try to kiss him off, he'll throw your ass in jail. So basically, you can dig to your heart's content. That's exactly what happened. By the summer of 2008, the investigation into the death of Tara Chavez stalled. Tara's husband, police officer Levi Chavez, remained a person of interest. Where we get some problems from people is that when people, especially officers, were taking the Fifth Amendment and not willing to talk to us. Valencia County Sheriff's Department started getting pressure to stop the investigation already. 
Tara's parents wanted to make sure their daughter's case wasn't abandoned. Nearly 10 months after Tara died, the Cordovas brought a wrongful death suit against Levi Chavez, the city of Albuquerque, and members of the Albuquerque Police Department. I explained to them that in a lawsuit, there is nothing off limits. We were able to depose people, request documentation, phone records, just lots of information. When the civil suit drops, there were a number of jaw-dropping allegations. Among other claims, the lawsuit alleged police showed up at the Chavez house the night Tara died and trampled the crime scene, possibly destroying evidence needed for the investigation. The defendants asserted they did nothing wrong and denied every allegation. So the Albuquerque Police Department, out of compassion, took out the bloody stuff out of the house so that the kids wouldn't have to see it. That was all done with the permission of and after Valencia County Sheriff's deputies and Aaron Jones had done their thing. The Cordova's attorney subpoenaed dozens of witnesses, including members of the police department, relatives, friends, co-workers, and even Levi himself. When you turned on your phone on Sunday, October 21st of 2007, did you get a whole series of texts? Yes. Approximately how many? I probably got like seven or eight. Throughout his deposition, Levi declined to answer a number of questions. We're taking a position that any questions that uh, are, are as well covered by the privilege. Levi's former girlfriend, Deborah Romero, provided some key testimony in the civil case. Deborah Romero, who's an APD officer, uh, Levi was having an affair with at the time Tara died. She was theoretically supposed to be his alibi for that night. Isn't it true you're not sure when he came? After uh, Saturday's shift ended at midnight, and whenever it is he came. Yeah, I don't to your recall bed. those times. You were asleep, right? Mm hmm. Deborah Romero's deposition was huge. Levi's alibi no longer appeared to be solid. Deborah Romero ultimately ended up admitting that she did not know when Levi actually came to her house. It went from an alibi to under oath, I can't tell you where he was. Another one of Levi's mistresses, who was also a client at Tara's salon, testified about a conversation she had with Tara concerning the Chavez's truck. According to the witness, Tara claimed the truck was part of an insurance fraud scheme. She told Levi about Tara saying that the truck wasn't stolen. Where it tied into in the motive, Tara was going to essentially rat him out as a law enforcement officer, that would have been devastating. No fraud charges were ever filed against Levi. As the civil lawsuit worked its way through the courts, Detective Jones still pursued the criminal investigation. In 2010, he was blindsided by some unexpected news. One of the reporters called me and said, Aaron, what is going on here? The sheriff just told me he's taking you off the case. The Valencia County Sheriff's Department decided to put the case on hold until there were fresh leads. You ever seen Raging Bull? I marked right down the hall into the sheriff's office with him and the captain, told them how wrong they were. I went home that night and I came back about 3 o'clock in the morning and I took every piece of that case out of my office, took it home, and I called in sick for the next three months. I spent those three months working the case and putting it all together. After meeting her family, I felt like I owed it to her. Jones was determined to push the case forward. I had actually been in contact with the district attorney's office, and I came to him just literally torn up about the case. And he said, Aaron, I believe in you. Bring me information on this case. We will tear this thing apart one ounce at a time, and we'll do whatever we have to do to prove or disprove it. The office decided we'd like to have an outside review, and the New Mexico State Police was kind enough to review the material for us. All the interviews, all the reports and everything, I ended up turning it over to the New Mexico State Police and to the district attorney's office, and they took it from there. In the fall of 2010, three years after Tara died, investigators with the New Mexico State Police poured through the case files. The thing that they kept pointing out is that it just didn't add up. The service weapon was a key to them. The magazine could not have cycled around after she was dead if it was unseated. 
In February of 2011, the city of Albuquerque and members of the police department settled with the Cordovas for $230,000, but denied any liability. Levi remained the only defendant in the civil lawsuit. As for criminal charges, the DA's office was still considering whether to indict Levi for murder. After reviewing the information about the gun being unseated, the fact that Tara was saying that if she ended up dead, Levi had done it. These things were huge to me in making a decision to go to the grand jury. On April 7, 2011, the grand jury issued its decision. Levi was charged with first-degree premeditated murder and tampering with evidence. We were relieved. Someone's listening to us. She did not commit suicide. Levi was arrested and released on bail. Levi was terrified. He was frankly baffled at how he could actually be indicted given the weakness of the case. There was nothing that told me it wasn't a suicide. It looked just like a suicide to me. The investigator, Baron Jones, was just on a mission to convict Levi and ignore any evidence to the contrary. I like the man. He's got a very big personality, but he had to be disbelieved. I had to prove he was twisting what witnesses had to say. The defense attorney actually told me, Detective Jones, you better get ready for war. In 2013, nearly six years after the death of Tara Chavez, her husband Levi stood trial for murder. The Albuquerque Police Department fired Levi not long after his indictment. Now, both Levi Chavez and Tara's family looked forward to their day in court. I was so excited about, finally, we're going to get some justice for Tara. Uh... The number one strategy in defending Levi's case was to dismantle all of the years of lies with the truth. Prosecutors faced some tough hurdles. In this case, we had almost no physical evidence part of that's because a lot of it was destroyed. That wasn't the state's only problem. The court delivered a decisive punch before the trial even started. Tara had been telling people that she was concerned about Levi and that if she ended up dead, Levi had done it. Almost all of the statements where Tara had said Levi did it had been suppressed by the court. The judge made what I believe was the correct ruling that no matter how salacious those statements sounded, that they were not good evidence, they were not admissible. The judge also barred testimony about Levi's alleged role in a suspected scam involving his stolen truck. That's the theory. He wanted to shut her up because he was in a stolen car ring. They were grasping at straws so bad to try and find a motive, and they never proved that the car was not stolen, much less Levi had anything to do with it. Still, the state believed there was enough evidence to prove Levi Chavez killed his wife. The only person present besides Tara's dead body is the defendant. Our theory was essentially that Levi had set up his alibi provided by his mistress, traveled back to Los Lunas where Tara was asleep. He then came in, pulled the service weapon that he had left there, put it into her mouth, fired off a round, left it where it was, accidentally unseating the magazine. Prosecutors hammered home on Levi's numerous affairs and painted him as a cruel husband who wanted Tara out of the way. The focus of the trial became Levi's inability to remain faithful and his endless parade of paramours um, who took the stand and were discussed during the trial. When they started talking about Levi's mistresses, it was tough to hear because my daughter loved him. She stayed with him, and now she's being shamed in public. I did not think believing he was very unfaithful to his wife translated to him murdering her. 
I do think Levi's cruelty and insensitivity drove her to commit suicide. The state's case boiled down to one witness and one piece of evidence. Really and truthfully, this case hinged on Aaron Jones. The jury had to believe Aaron Jones when he said that when he found the gun, the magazine was unseated. If they don't believe him, we have absolutely no physical evidence whatsoever in this case. The detective told jurors he found Levi's service weapon at the scene with the magazine released. If the magazine is unseated, so not locked into place, it is impossible for Tara to have killed herself since another round was found chambered in the gun ready to be fired. The defense went on the attack. I had to prove that Darren Jones was the one that had access and supposedly discovered the unseated magazine. I had to make him, in the eyes of the jury, not credible. Aaron Jones was a dishonest, lying cop. When the police first investigated the case, they collected the gun. They didn't notice anything funny later into the investigation. Aaron Jones says, aha, this gun is partially unseated. They attacked everything in my career, good and bad. I spent two and a half days on the stand. There's times I literally wanted to just slap the crap out of that defense attorney. Levi Chavez wasn't on trial. Aaron Jones was on trial. The defense argued the state didn't have proof beyond a reasonable doubt to convict Levi of murder and that all the facts pointed to suicide. Tara was unfortunately a very sad and needy and insecure person, particularly about that relationship. Her feeling of worthlessness just built up to the point where all she could think about was her pain. It was so disgusting to sit there and listen to them paint this picture of someone that Tara was not. She wasn't helpless. She wasn't sad. And I'll never forget it. The defense also tried to prove Tara was physically capable of shooting herself and releasing the magazine on the gun. We got our crime scene uh, reconstruction expert, and we posed the question to him. Is it possible to fire a bullet and then have the magazine come unseated? Levi's defense wagered big on their expert's presentation, but the demonstration completely backfired. He was unable to demonstrate how a finger would continue rolling to the release button. He literally tried and tried, and he couldn't make it happen. I'm thinking, damn, that didn't go well. I better come up with some damage control. Coming up, in a surprise move, the defense calls Levi Chavez. Couldn't take your eyes off the guy. The courtroom was shocked. The defense in the murder trial of Levi Chavez suffered a big hit. A courtroom demonstration designed to prove Tara Chavez shot herself was a colossal failure. The general public thought that Levi's goose was cooked because of the gun. Levi's defense attorney needed to make a bold move with his next witness. The courtroom was shocked. There were audible gasps throughout the courtroom. The defense called Levi Chavez to the stand. There was a lot of commentary that putting Levi on the stand was a Hail Mary pass I was throwing, that because things had gone so horribly with the gun that the only possible way Levi could, had a shot was to testify. If you couldn't take your eyes off the guy while he was on the, on the witness stand, he was a very compelling witness. It was very difficult always for Levi to relive those moments. He was crying, extremely emotional. Levi adamantly denied that he murdered Tara and staged her death to look like a suicide. The prosecution tried to refute Levi's testimony. Levi on the stand was 
somewhat robotic. He had been told over and over and over again how to answer things. During the incredibly brief cross-examination by prosecutors, he bullied them. Levi pushed him around. He, he cut him off in the middle of a question and say things like, hey, I'm gonna talk to my jury now. We didn't spend as much time on cross with him because he was just gonna keep answering the questions the exact same way, no matter how you ask them. The trial lasted about six weeks. It was one of the most difficult things to go through sitting there, listening to them kill Tara all over again. Tara Chavez is found dead, single gunshot to the head. It took jurors two days to reach their decision. The stakes were enormous. If found guilty, Levi Chavez faced spending the rest of his life in prison. The tension in the room, you know, the old saying, you could have cut it with a knife. It couldn't have been truer. So I was trying to reassure him because he was very nervous and he was clutching his rosary beads and he was praying a lot. We find the defendant, Leo Chavez, not guilty of first degree murder. On July 16th, 2013, nearly six years after Tara's death, the jury acquitted Levi of all charges. I think Levi was stunned. I think Levi never doubted his innocence. When I heard not guilty, it was crushing. I was absolutely speechless. My heart sank. I immediately stood up. I gestured my family to come with me. And I turned my back to the judge. And we walked out. Levi Chavez he went home and started uh, rebuilding his life with his kids. In December 2013, Tara's parents dropped their civil lawsuit against Levi. He has custody of our grandchildren. To go after Levi for any monetary gain would only take food out of their mouths. Despite the outcome of the trial, the prosecution contends that Tara was the victim of homicide. The case is closed. I still absolutely believe that uh, somebody killed Derek Cordova Chavez. Tara's friends and family try not to dwell on her death. They prefer to remember the joy Tara brought into their lives. I just want the world to know who Tara was as a person, how beautiful she was inside and out. Tara was a strong woman. She was passionate about her family. She was just good person and she deserved to have her life she was a shining star her life was cut short but she was a shining star tara's family will never stop looking for answers we know tara did not commit suicide i'm not done searching for the truth i'll go to my grave looking for this truth